Fantastic. <laughs> we did it. Good morning, David, and welcome to Great Minds in Quarantine. How are you this morning? Well, life has changed for us a little less than it's changed for most people. Uh, my rhythms are the same and I work in the same place. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's resulted in, um, shall we say, even more people asking, so what's next? What's next? Exactly. Well, we can introduce David as uh, one of the great science fiction writers and also somebody who is pressing it. That is, his nonfiction works have talked about what could be happening and, and actually is now happening. I'm a fan of the one where the science fiction book where other species are genetically raised up to our to be our equals. I mean, that is a fantastic idea. But David also did, of course, uh, the books that became the movies, uh, for instance, The Postman with Kevin Costner and is kind of the go-to guy uh, in Hollywood for what the future ought to be. But uh, uh, the future is now. So what are you up to right now, David? Oh, well, uh, it's, that's very flattering coming from a fellow um, as erudite and insightful as, as Steve. Um, and hello to our fellow panelists, Alexis and Amanda, our gracious hostess with the mostess. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, I was, <laughs> I lost track of time. I was fixing a drawer in the kitchen. Um, and, and I'm so, so sorry about that. Now, the, as far as, you know, what I'm, I'm up to, well, I'm, I'm trying to write an, another novel uh, in that universe, in that uplift universe set in the in a future when humanity has done what is already being attempted, and that is altering other creatures um, uh, to suit us, and in that future, it suits us to make them intelligent enough to be our equals. Um, but uh, there have been other stories about uplift before I wrote uh, those uplift novels. Well, uh, Pierre Boulle, uh, the author of uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, Cordwainer Smith, um, H.G. Wells, uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau, um, all of those portrayed what we would call uplift, what I named uplift, but they all took the simple morality tale that uh, we would be unkind. And if you have to have some stories about a topic, it's much better to have criticism, forward-looking criticism about how things might go wrong. Well, that's one thing about your ethic. It's, it's, it's not exactly gentle, but it is about making things better, that it doesn't have to be all everybody attacking everybody in divisions, whether it's right, left, political, or tribalists in different uh, countries. You have sort of, uh, you're sort of solution-oriented, and that's kind of rare for science fiction. How do you do that? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, people think that science propels science fiction, and it does to a very large degree. But science fiction is the literature that deals with change. Things might be different than they are, mm -hmm. and or than you assume in the backdrop of the story. And that's what distinguishes science fiction from the mother genre, which is fantasy. Uh, fantasy has been around since Gilgamesh and the Iliad and the Odyssey and all that sort of thing. And it's the mother genre of fantastic literature. But most fantasy stories uh, assume that the feudal social system that we suffered under for 6,000 years is natural. And it is. Um, and that it can't be evaded. And uh, that's what we're out to disprove. Uh, that for 240 years, the West has had this incredible experiment in a different attractor state. And one of the topics that I talk about is the Fermi paradox, why we don't see any signs of extraterrestrial creatures. And of the hundred possible hypotheses for, to explain why we don't see intelligent civilizations out in the stars, uh, my favorite and the one never mentioned anywhere else is that others get caught in this trap of feudalism as we were in 99% of cultures for 6,000 years with only a few little experiments with a different state like Periclean Athens and Flor Michelangelo's Florence. Except for those little tiny experiments, feudalism is, um, is, is, is the pretty much reflexive thing that humans do when they're under stress and under pressure. And that is large males pick up metal implements, 
take other men's women and wheat, and you notice who I excluded from any thought of power, and uh, leave ownership of the serfs to their uh, spoiled inheritance brat sons. And I just saw a, 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 new, a word that I had never heard before, just yesterday, no. that pretty much, pretty much describes what we're endu- enduring right now. And that's attempted re-infutilization. I think it's re-infudation. And that is a re-establishment of feudalism. Well, that's a big that's word. A bit of a rant. How do you, yeah, that was a bit of a rant, but how do you, how do you put, especially when I said you were optimistic and hopeful on everything, oh, However, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think about um, COVID? How does uh, some of your thoughts fit into where we are now? For instance, you talk about, you know, the dangers to privacy several years ago with the internet, you were one of the pioneers of that and won a great award for the freedom book. However, uh, we're there now, right? Talking about, uh, 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 finding people on their apps uh, if they have any kind of disease and if they have COVID. And this seems to be a good thing to a lot of people. Can you uh, rant on that a little bit? What do you think? Well, first off, let me finish. Uh, I, guess, I think I had a senior moment there. I, I usually am able to go full circle back to the question. And your question was, why I'm an optimist when, when on this whole re feudalization thing, I sounded like I was, you know, your typical, oh, we're going to hell thing. Well, the basic thing is that science fiction is not about science. It's about history. And if you look at the literature of change, it's about this era of history in which change is actually possible. And this horrible litany of misery that was caused by so many mistakes, especially feudalism, that is the great human drama. And what science fiction tries to do is it tries to extend that drama in warning directions, directions that try to become self-preventing prophecies by stirring people to prevent this future, or that suggest a possible way out or a possible positive future, as in Star Trek, or alternate realities that exper- make history an experimental topic. And when I look back at human history and how horrible it was and how steep the odds have been against us and how surprising our revolution has been, I am forced by mere honesty to be an optimist simply because anything else is to be a horrible ingrate. Hmm. Uh, and, And it's not because I actually believe that our chances are good. The chances, the odds are against us as they've always been. I just think that it would be stupid and ungrateful not to recognize that other generations managed to get past their stupidities. Wow. During this 200 year experiment. You know, um, I, I saw a, a, a one of these Periscope films. You should look up the Periscope films, yes. series of documentaries, footage from olden times, and one was about the 442nd Regimental Combat Team of the Japanese. The sons of the interned people went over and ran the most heroic American combat unit in World War II in Italy. And it was a film that showed them and praised them while they're in all the theaters in America, while their parents were in camps. Wow. And another one was about the, uh, it was said, the Negro soldier. And it's cringeworthy from our perspective, patronizing and cringeworthy. But if you put yourself in that era, the massive intent to propagandize against the bad was so clear uh, in these thing, in these films that that showed up in in all the theaters. And there was one unforgettable moment at the end where they said, uh, we don't pretend that everything's perfect. It's not. But as Sergeant Joe Lewis, and it shows Joe Lewis, the boxer, getting a medal, said, there's nothing wrong with America that Adolf Hitler can fix. (laughs) And then it went on to say, we're not pretending prejudice doesn't exist. It does. Oh. But there's nothing wrong with America that Americans can't fix. Hmm. And this was two years before Truman 
desegregated the military, and there was no going back. Wow. Let me ask you something in respect to what you just said. And, and that was just so powerful. And I love the idea of science fiction as history. I've never really thought of that. But when I think of science fiction, Strange in a Strange Land, Planet of the Apes, I mean, all the ones that you've mentioned, there is a new kind of science fiction that's happening today that seems to be deliberate, not for collective introspection, but for collective, um, co- collective acrimony. And that's what it's, it's, it's marketed as fake news, right? So we have a virus that's confronting our collective mortality. And in the midst of that, we have something called fake news. Can I call that a kind of science fiction that is designed to further separate us from each other? Well, I wouldn't because I don't want to own that. Uh, besides which, if you go across those 6,000 years, the kings and the priests and the lords controlled the media. And this gets back to Steve's question about uh, transparency. The, the uh, problem is not that we're going to have light flooding through the world. That is unstoppable. My friends at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the ACLU and Amnesty International, and every year I urge everybody to join those organizations because these are heroes, these are paladins for freedom who are on the front row and 50% of their efforts are completely in vain and dumb because they see the right problem. Pointed out, by the way, by a great science fiction novel, which is the epitome of self-preventing prophecies called 1984. Look it up. Um, probably the most very high. I don't think it was born. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you were born, Amanda. Um, the, the point is that, that it's not possible, as some of these activists are claiming, to outlaw face recognition to put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, what, what now takes supercomputers and Google will be on your phone tomorrow as, a, as an app. Face recognition is here. Uh, the fact that you're going to be seen out of doors and recognized uh, is, is here. It's going to be here. The question is, can we avoid, because, because that's the way things were in the past. The kings knew who the serfs were. They knew where you were. Okay. The question is not, will elites see you? The question is, will we see them enough to make sure they can't do anything to us? Mm-hmm. What they know about us is not as important as what they can do to us. And if they are stripped naked, they may know all about us, but they don't dare do stuff to us. Well, and that how do we have transparency toward them then? How do we make that Exactly. Happen? It's called surveillance, S-O-U-S. That's French for from under, as sur is French for from above. Okay. So surveillance, surveillance, looking back at power. And if you look at the last 200 years, that's progressively what we did. Imperfectly, horribly imperfectly. But what saved Martin Luther King, what saved Gandhi, was the reporters who were on the scene. He said so. What saved Martin Luther King were those primitive cameras in Selma and during the marches. He said so. And so, that's what's going to save us. So as we, way, Dave, Dave is referring to this great book. It's nonfiction. The Transparent Society, Will Technology Make Us Choose Between Freedom and Privacy? This is sort of like volume two of that, right, Dave? So, yes, yeah, so that's, that's my, my book um, um, from 1997. Um, it has a chapter in it called The End of Photography as Proof of Anything at All. <laughs> so as well, we- I would add in Dune as one of the great political histories that is done as a science fiction. The movie wasn't so great. It kind of focused on the worms everywhere, you know. No, but, I, uh, I kind of liked it. it. It was cool. Did you write part of that? No, 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 no. I, 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 um, 
I've studied Frank Herbert, and I think he was trying to do a self-preventing prophecy, and nobody got it. Huh, his, his so? main thing about Dune is that it's about the reinsta- the permanent reinstallation of feudalism. And huh. average people have no rights and aren't even involved in the story mm-hmm. at any level. At least Tolkien, when he was a romantic and he did feudalism is inevitable, it's the natural form of things, at least he focused the story on the archetype common yeoman, the hobbits. Well, that was because uh, he thought those people would win the war, as did the most elitist person of all time that we have great hagiography about now, Winston Churchill. I'm reading this, The Splendid and the Vile at the moment, quite a title by uh, oh, wow. Eric Lawson. And uh, it's a good book for our times. But go ahead. You're sort of, you have a great understanding of every science fiction major writing there is. What, um, well, Alexis had a question, I, 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 th- I think. <laughs> Is it possible at some point in the future, the weaponization of technology? I mean, somebody said, I heard the other day that the worst virus on the planet is human behavior. Is there a point we'll ever come together as a global family and be able to not weaponize our engagement and our technology and economy with each other? Terribly important question. But again, it's a matter of historical perspective compared to what? We are vile compared to the dreams we have of what we ought to be. And where did we get those dreams? Where did we get the amazing arrogance to assume that cavemen could actually create a civilization in which we retain individualism and eccentricity and ambition, and yet deal with each other with friendly, flat competition, joyful competition, and not yeah. cheating. Mm. Star Trek, Hollywood. Yeah. The notion that we might be better than we are is, uh, oh, you could say that it's in all the religions, but that was just hand-waving, finger-wagging. That notion that, Alexis, that you are comparing us and we are faulty compared to is in itself science fictional. Because there are no examples from human history of that ever having happened. Compared to 99.999% of human history, we are marvels of morality and decency and flat, fair, joyful competition. I feel better already. Well, (laughs) this is why my blog is called Contrary Brim. Right. If I'm in the company of optimists, I will throw bricks. <laughs> we cannot let up for an instant. And right now, amid re infutilization, man, we need to be out there in blue uniforms with, you know, uh, sons of Lincoln. Mm. But, but losing this historical perspective is i think our biggest problem because we should do this fight with a song in our hearts because my god how much better we are than our parents and our parents did that they made us better have you met millennials and the new generation z they are nice <laughs> they are Better than us. Have you have you have you tried this Gen Xer here? No, she's a young Gen Xer, more like a millennial here. Uh, my she kid is, calls me a boomer, and I am not is, a boomer. You are not. She she is nice, and that that's what means she's not a boomer because we're a bunch of self centered, talk too much uh, assholes, but who gets credit for how nice they are, huh? Cool. Yeah. David, you have three children. You're not, I mean, you have written, so, been so prolific, but at the same time, you're not one of those authors just, you know, who looks at their navel and is always writing by themselves. So how do you balance that? I don't. I, I am a dilettante. I am a dilettante. I am a flake. Uh, if I know people who are professional science fiction authors. They sit down and they write science fiction. Yeah. I write science fiction on a dare now and then. <laughs> it's the thing civilization has said that I'm best at. 
And instead, I'm doing political blather, and I, I well, I'm, I'm with NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program, so I, I do some science and I do some consulting about, about possible new ways to get out into space and all of that. Um, and I'm, I help to establish our, um, UCSD's Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, now chaired by um, the great physicist Brian Keating and uh, great neurosurgeon um, um, physician. Is it Terry? X Prize Maven, um, Eric Beery. Mm. Uh, and occasionally we meet at the Bella Vista Cafe. <laughs> um, brought to you by. <laughs> sponsor. Yes. Uh, but no, the, 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 I, I, <sighs> If I truly were grateful to this civilization, I'd do what this civilization clearly wanted me to do. And it wasn't what I got my PhD at, at UCSD. You know, we should say that. I mean, of course, you went to Caltech uh, along with MIT, the greatest uh, science school in many ways in, in America. You have a P and you were a physicist. You have a PhD from UCSD working with Nobel Prize winners. So you have inventions. You work with NASA. Maybe we're being a little humble here. What, uh, <laughs> what are you doing with NASA, for instance? Oh, uh, the, the NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program. Um, that's NASA's mini micro seed Fund and they give out about 20 grants per year to uh, folks who have taken an almost science fictional idea and made it seem like it just might be plausible. Mm -hmm. So the, the grants are little, little teeny $250,000 grants to, to just do the, the lab top experiments and several of them have been huge successes and some of them were just embarrassing and it was just the right ratio well, it sounds like a sort of darpa of uh science fiction in the future that's that's right and um it, as as the head of um of uh nyack jason derleth says if we weren't graduating 10 percent of our grants to an amazed world that gloms onto them and, and, and hurls millions at, at them, we wouldn't be doing our job. If there weren't 10% that embarrassed us and we realized, ow, we shouldn't have done that, um, then, then we're not being daring enough. And that should be what we're doing as a civilization. Can you speak to like the seeming uh, and the real lack of science in the current administration? What, what does that mean for America? Have we are we a, have a science society out here in the, in the blue states and not elsewhere? What is going on that there's this total disrespect for science and has kind of caught us by the lungs, unfortunately? Well, look, in Britain, they used to take scientists and. Let me back off even further than that. Uh, people wonder why most of the world follows the British or French um, model for university education, and you get your baccalaureate degree in three years. Uh, Canada and the United States, it's four years. Now, what's the difference? If you ask a European or someone like that, they'll, they'll answer, well, it's because your students are so stupid, they need an extra year. <laughs> um, I have proof that that's not true. But no, the difference is in these other university systems, a 17-year-old, an 18-year-old goes to university and specializes the way that we're familiar with it being done for grad students. Mm -hmm. In other words, you do one thing and you study that in depth. Um, and to us, as Americans and Canadians, that's a criminal. A 17-year-old is a fetus. How can a 17-year-old decide what to specialize in? Uh, it's, it's, it's absurd. They, they barely have the umbilical cord off. Uh, so what we do is you can, all right, you, if you, you can go into a generally in the arts, pick a, some kind of a major. You could go generally into science. You could go generally into engineering. But if you're a nerd going into the sciences, you are required to take a whole year's worth of breadth requirements, uh, a whole year's worth of English, 
um, and, and literature, a whole year's worth of history and culture and things like that, uh, half a year of arts. And what this resulted in was a great many nerds who realized this other stuff is fairly easy. And if I want to make a company, I can bloody well make a company. If I want an MBA, I can get an MBA mm -hmm. on top of this nerdy stuff. And the result was the Silicon Valley culture. But the other side of it, the coin is that all the arts majors, all the English majors have to take one year's worth, three or four, usually four, general science survey classes. Pass fail. I've taught in both directions when I was at UCSD. Yeah. I taught, I taught um, uh, uh, science fiction literature, which was the most popular of the outreach breadth requirement literature <laughs> courses for the nerds. <laughs> and I taught astronomy for poets. Nice. Which was the second most popular breadth requirement course for the artsies. What do you think, Amanda? Did you do you have some lacks in these areas, or do you think? Um, I mean, first of all, I think why us Americans need four years because the first year I was in Tijuana perfecting Tijuana. <laughs> so I needed that extra year. Um, but I, I took. I remember taking a science course with Sally Ride. Um, yeah, it was difficult. I was a poli sci major, a Spanish lit minor, and a dance minor, and I lived in Spain a year, so. The science classes, um, I had to take them. And I just wish I, I had that science mind. But I love that there are science, scientists like yourself that are able to jump to the other side and share, share your, your knowledge with us through your form of artwork. I mean, it's extraordinary. I did pull up um, a few quotes that really struck me. And we started off the conversation and you were talking about it. Uh, one was change is the principal feature of our age and literature should explore how people deal with it. The best science fiction does that head on. So again, I just think it's amazing that you, you are a scientist and an artist at the same time. And that's what I found out at Bella Vista is, oh my gosh, there's all these scientists that have an artistic side of the brain as well. Either they're painters or I had a scientist come and just like bust it on the dance floor at a salsa night. And a lot of them are musicians. We actually had a group from Salk that came over and they would play. We thought about doing um, the Mesa's Got Talent, you know, and highlight all of these scientists that are artistic. I, I think that's a great idea. When I was at Caltech, I was amazed how all the top scientists I knew had artistic sidelines. My father told me he took me to see uh, Einstein play the violin when I was four. Wow. wow. Um, you know, Richard Feynman was one of the world's greatest bongo players uh, and a painter. Um, I argued Finnegan's Wake with, with uh, Murray Gilman one day. Uh, he knew it and I didn't. <laughs> the other... The other um, the other thing that you said that really struck me was why must conversations always come so late? Why do people always apologize to corpses? And when I was looking at that quote, I thought, wow, um, you know, a lot of people are using this pandemic and this quarantine and this time of isolation to heal um, not only themselves, but to heal family relationships. And I just, Wondered if you might have a certain perspective or idea um, coming now, looking at your own quote. You did say that, right? Yeah. Well, this, this goes back to two things Steve said, and I'm, 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 I'm trying. I used to be really good at circling back. Uh, first off, he talked about COVID, and the other thing was the uh, war on science. I did circle back. All right. We are always in circular conversation with brains. The brain's not dead yet. Um, yeah, absolutely, Amanda. Uh, the 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 thing that um, that we have to do is constantly be wary of our human trait of delusion. Mm -hmm. It is the greatest source of human creativity. Mm -hmm. 
and source of hypotheses that we can then test in science. And it is the source of our greatest tragedies. And it's why feudalism and royalty and all of that were so bad. Not because they were oppressive. That's bad. Mm -hmm. But because the kings and priests and lords suppressed the criticism that is the only antidote to delusion. Mm -hmm. Because I cling to my delusions. I love them. They are, they are subjectively, you know, voluptuous to me, yeah. especially male fantasies, but that's another story. Um, but I know I've been trained to recite the religious catechism of science, which is, I might be wrong. Ain't that cool? Let's find out. Teaching millions of young people to recite that has made a large fraction of them 50% honest, which is probably the highest that human beings have ever been honest in all of the history of our species, which means that scientists actually pre-find maybe 50% of their mistakes, even their beloved ones. Now, that's one of the reasons why, to answer Steve, the war on science is going on because it is fact-oriented, and it's not just science, it's all fact-oriented professions. Because these are the elites that have to be destroyed if feudalism is to be re restored. That is well, a very well, strong thing to say. So you think that this is about restoring feudalism by questioning what really is going on. What by having a single source of declared wisdom. Ah. declared ex cathedra from the top, from the chair, by the kings and the priests. It, it, it is very convenient for them. But history says that it is a, it is a recipe for disaster right. because even very smart kings, even the best kings who tried not to surround themselves with sycophants and flatterers and to get a variety of voices, it's the king system that made sure that eventually they would be flattered into pursuing a mistake that would destroy the kingdom or to certainly destroy the livelihoods of the serfs down below. So it's the stupidity of oligarchy and feudalism. That's the biggest reason to fight it. Um, and secondarily, the cruelty and the... Uh, and the destruction of civil life and, 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 and the fact that this society that evaded that trap is just so much more damn fun <laughs> and creative, and but it's the discovery of errors. Cito Kate, criticism is the only known antidote to error. And that's why I wrote The Transparent Society, because there is only one antidote to delusion, including delusions by, clasped by our friends on the left. Sure. And that is reciprocal, flat, fair, competitive transparency and argument over fact. And it is the destruction of fact that is the topic of my latest nonfiction book. All right. Brought to you by... Bella Vista. <laughs> By the Bella Vista Cafe and Social Clubs. Political Judo. Um, Political like Judo. Um, and it is my latest uh, book that I rushed out self-published because any of my regular publishers would have taken two years or a year. Right. I wanted it out in time to possibly influence the election. And there has not been reviewed once anywhere well let's change <laughs> that we're gonna change that david i did have something just for if there's you know um single moms or working moms out there um that you know just a point for them to connect and i think being a parent uh, a lot of times people ask me like what have you learned um as you grow up and one of the hardest things i learned was that yes we are still living in the feudal system and that's, it, it's like when you grow up and you realize your parents are imperfect, right? It's one of those moments. And so when I grew up and I realized, oh shit, 
we're all kings and queens and we're living in a feudal system and it's just a different soundtrack and different costumes. And so it's very hard as a parent to, to go through that transition first yourself and then try and keep that delusion for your son and then see him grow up. Well, let's, let's not forget re- recapitulation. And that is that when uh, our, our, our babies are in the womb, they have gills and a tail. Uh, some even have little residual marks when they're born from the gills. Um, there's no question that if you've had toddlers, you're dealing with <laughs> um, you're dealing with monkeys, and a little later <laughs> they are cavemen, and uh, teenagers really are re- recapitulating Rome, <laughs> and so some degree of authority that is hierarchical is called for. (laughs) But but then again, there may be people watching this video, uh, you know, a hundred years from now, and by people, I mean dolphins and AIs and all that, (laughs) who who say, well, there's, there's, there's your, there's your parentalist. He's, he, he got past misogyny and he got past all those other things, but he was still a parentalist. A parentalist, what's that mean? Yeah, that, mean this, 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 that means he still believes in the hierarchy of parental uh, power. Uh, oh. Oh, oh, no, I do go, I do have to go alpha on my son as we're having that struggle, most definitely, but it's just hard um, because you want your kids to believe that in the system of equity and, um, and like you said, kids are more compassionate. Kids are more purpose driven and kids yes, are smarter. You invite him to comment on your rulings. When you get right down to it, it's a step. I don't know. That's pretty radical, David. So uh, do you have councils, family councils when your uh, children were younger? Oh, uh, ours? Yeah. Oh, ours were full of sass. <laughs> a, bunch of, a bunch of sassy, you know, uppity, I think was the word. <laughs> you know, I was going to take you back to, um, I've often thought that uh, it's almost like we're, we're not exactly slaves, but look at all the students. They are indentured servants. Everybody has to pay back the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of student loans. They all, as adults, they all have mortgages. They have these sort of capitalist tethers that may be nicer, certainly in a place like Denmark or something, but it does seem to be the same structure as that uh, pharaoh, you know. It was always G. William Domhoff, who uh, certain sociologists have always said that all 99, 95% of everything written uh, uh, about sociology is really a way to control those below the, the 1%, and nobody ever talks about them. Well, if you look in Hong Kong, for instance, it's been said that Hong Kong is a giant rent generating machine because a lot of people there uh, have substantial incomes and over 50 percent of it goes out back to the city or to the Communist Party or to the landlords instantly in a cycle. Now, you could say that we are on the same treadmills. And uh, this is why I think one of the most important weapons uh, that I think people need to use in uh, this struggle, the current struggle we're in in America, is to invoke the emotional value of what was called the greatest generation. My parents, the rest of you are too young. Maybe Steve. Uh, and, And because there is a romantic attachment to them on the part of Trump's America. You use that in a judo way, in, 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 with a judo move, and you say, can you name for me wh- whose picture was on the walls of all of those heroes who overcame the depression and uh, destroyed Hitler and contained communism and, and, and defeated Stalin and built the world's uh, greatest economy and the world's greatest research institutions and took us to the moon. Uh, Whose picture was on their wall? Who was the most adored living person in that generation? 
And I gotta Google it. Hold on, I gotta Google it. <laughs> say, yeah, Kennedy, but I thought you were going to mean Lincoln before that. You know, no, the great Franklin Delano Roosevelt. All right. And uh, so the social contract that was built then resulted in all of those things. And it was not communist. As a matter of fact, a lot of people don't know this. Even probably 99% of Democratic politicians don't know this. But the great force that propelled the United States to actively um, confront uh, the Soviet Union, rather than passively through um, isolationism, was the AFL-CIO the American Federation of Labor, the, uh, the labor unions. Mm. See, Stalin had in 1947 done the great defenestration where all of the, all of the non-communist labor union leaders in Eastern Europe um, jumped out of fifth story balconies pretty much within the same month. Mm. Jumped out of balconies. Um, and this ignited in George Meany and the American labor movement a volcanic fury. It was Stalin's second biggest mistake after ignoring Hitler's plans to invade. Mm. Because it, it ignited in America a uniform consensus that this was evil. Whereas it had not been a consensus. I mean, after all, they had been our allies in World War II. Um, and what, what I'm getting at is that the rigid one-dimensional politics that we see is old hat, it's archaic. And if you don't want to fight a World War I style trench battle, but one of maneuver, then you have to get out of the trenches, you have to get around the cliches and the stereotypes. And I'm afraid, you know, some of our allies, um, they love the, the sumo type fight. Well, it's just fascinating that you are so involved in history, so aware of that, and that infuses your science fiction. Oh, absolutely. The, the, for, well, for example, the, uh, my novel, The Postman, that Kevin Costner filmed. Uh, Wait, a lot sorry, of and I have to ask for every woman and gay man that's watching how was it working with kevin costner <laughs> <laughs> now don't forget I kevin mean, costner, let's make it real news here okay kevin costner was the tom hanks of his era and one of the reasons why american women were so furious with him was because they actually thought he was a tom hanks husband and father Mm. Uh, boy, you should see what's going to happen to Hanks if he ever <laughs> he had better behave himself. No fury like. Um, no, for I, I met uh, Costner's uh, children uh, mm. at the set of The Postman. That was his family movie. He cast all of his kids because he was trying to keep them keep their trust after he did the bad thing. Um, no, people ask me about the Postman movie, and my response is that uh, I have very mixed feelings. First off, I didn't get hardly any money for it, but that was that was largely the fault of my then agent. Ooh. Um, and <laughs> Costner personally, let me say that if I were a uh, truly a weak egoed person. Um, I, I, I hate the man's guts because he was terribly rude to me. Uh, we exchanged maybe 12 words. He, um, <laughs> if you're making a movie of somebody's book, you'd think you'd take him to dinner once. He never bought me a beer. Uh, but I don't think that's so important. What's important is the man is probably one of the 10 greatest cinematographers in the history of Hollywood. My goodness. His movies are so drop dead beautiful, and The Postman is, I think, one of the dozen most musically, James Newton Howard, and visually one of the most beautiful films ever shot. It is worth watching just for that. And the main thing that made the biggest difference was the heart. Somehow, with Brian Helgeland, and despite his being a jerk, um, Hollywood does that to people. You have to bear that in mind. Most of human history, the principal heroes were warriors. We've shifted that horrible ego burden just in time, 
over to entertainers who are driven mad the way warriors were. Mm. Because we can't afford for our warriors to be insane egotists, but we can afford entertainers to be. In any event, the heart of my book, the core message that the hero is important, but mostly to remind the survivors and the people to lift their heads out of the mud and remember that they were once mighty beings called citizens. And it is only they who can build, or in this case, rebuild civilization. And he nailed that. And for that, I will forgive anything, including the third trait of that movie, is that it, it was spectacularly dumb. All the brains from my book scooped out and thrown away, um, especially the last 20 minutes. But gorgeous, big-hearted, and dumb? <laughs> That's what my wife married. <laughs> it's time for a remake. Maybe we do a remake. <laughs> Let me ask you this. We are actually, there's discussions right now. There's discussions right now, Amanda. Okay. There's, there's serious talk, and I, I just mentioned a while ago a guy who might be involved. Well, well I, can we be friend, back on uh, answers? I, or extras? My friend, my friend Peter Rowe interviewed you some time back, and so I texted him saying, Amanda and Steve and I are going to be interviewing David. So Peter Rowe, uh, who you know, asked me to ask you this question. And say hi for me. And I will, I will indeed. And he said to us, David, what is the next book you'd like to see as a movie? That's Pete's question. I want to ask you a question that's a little bit more serious. Are we doomed? So I do want you to answer that question. Are we doomed to live a nihilistic existence and have to somehow dance with nihilism throughout generation and through the eternity of humankind? But answer Pete's question first. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, you and I need dinner together. <laughs> and we'll invite the other, the two good looking ones uh, also. We'll invite them all. Do you see? <laughs> okay, as if anybody's better looking than Alexis. <laughs> Flattery to get myself out of the, out of the question. Um, Answer Pete's the, question. The all right, the, 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 all right. The, the uh, Kiln People, K-I-L-N People, is a novel of mine that's one of my most fun and funny. And it, uh, oops, and it's uh, set in a, in a future where you can make copies of yourself every day that can go out into the world. They're cheap, they're made of clay, they have no rights, but they come back at the end of the day having done stuff you don't have to tell them what to do because they have your memories. Okay. If they come back and they've been successful, you download their memories and you have been five different people that day. Crazy. You got done everything you needed to get done that day. That's just women. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> women. I'm living that oh. shit right now. While I'm in the pandemic. <laughs> I, except that we would all love for you to make copies of yourself, Amanda, so you could get even more done. Avatar. Yes, and then, 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 then the real you would, uh, would, would just charm everybody's socks off. All right. The, the others that, uh, there's always talk of my, you know, Dolphins in Space uplift series getting made into a movie, but it's actually some of my short stories that, um, that I would most like to see done. Um, there's one called The Giving Plague that I'm working with a young writer on right now that is basically extremely topical. It's about how viruses negotiate with their hosts. Wow. And if you remind me, one minute, two minutes before the end, I'll sing you a song about that. Perfect. But The Giving Plague, um, Amanda will have a link to that um, mm -hmm. at the bottom. And it's a short story about how um, some older guys get addicted to giving blood. I, I was just refused. I just had three cancellations in a row from the blood bank because of COVID. And, and I'm kind of anxious to give my 96th pint. Right. Wow. Um, because only four more and they give you a, 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 a free soda. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I did get, when I, when I did my eighth yawn, I, 
<laughs> you a beer with Kevin Costner. That's what they give you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I gave my 80th pint, they gave me a 10-gallon hat because that's 10 gallons. Wow. Ah, symbolic. Uh, right, 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 right. So that's one that I would love to see uh, filmed. Another is called Dr. Pack's Preschool. And that's that would creep people out if we got a really good script because what happens is this woman uh, becomes pregnant. Her husband finds out it's a boy, the fetus is a boy, and insists on installing a teaching unit so he can get, the, the, the fetus can get pre, 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 preschool. Uh, and the first hundred um, uh, pregnancies that this happens, it, it works. The kids come out with, you know, perfect pitch and a few other things, but nothing abnormal. But then they, they find out how to eliminate birth trauma and they put the kids to work as programmers in the womb. And this does not have good consequences. Um, so that would, that would be an extremely creepy movie. Now, nihilism. Actually, that segues pretty well. Look, it, it's certainly worth worrying about that the uh, romantics and the traditionalists might be right, that human beings who are not controlled by a hierarchical structure or by a uh, relatively firm set of inculcated shared beliefs um, might go to follow the individualistic path um, into, uh, into nihilism. And that has been the criticism of the great, it's what the Chinese and the, and the Russians and the Saudis and most of the um, uh, re-infutilizing oligarchs um, uh, press as their party, shared party line. And that is that uh, individualism and emphasis on separate uh, eccentricity um, cannot work because we lose the cohesiveness that was the consistent uh, trait uh, spread by uh, most past cultures. To that I have to answer, yeah, but <laughs> if you look at what we accomplish through this individualism and uh, appreciation. I mean, if you look at Hollywood, what are the four positive and two negative messages that are in almost every Hollywood film? One uh, is suspicion of authority. You have to fight an authority figure to have a dramatic movie. Uh, if, if it could be the go a government agency gone rogue, it could be a co mad corporation. It, it, it's generally a, very often a rich person or a, a mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, uh, individualism, uh, appreciation of eccentricity, tolerance and diversity. Okay, those are pressed in almost every Hollywood film, and they've had major effects. The two bad ones are. Um, no institution can ever be trusted, and uh, your neighbors are all useless sheep. And these two are pushed not for moral reasons because the directors want to push them, but because they're lazy. Because if the uh, protagonist has a problem and dials 911 and immediately gets help from skilled professionals, where's the fun in that? Right. Or knocks on a neighbor's door and the neighbor says, that that gang wants to do what? Hold on a second. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, you see that sometimes in movies. And when you see an institution functioning, you have to separate the hero from that institution. Mm -hmm. So 911 doesn't work, or the cops are late, or if they show up on time, they're incompetent, or if they show up on time and they're competent, then they're in cahoots with the bad guy. So you've all seen this. Yeah. Sure. And then so, the Dirty Harry takes over and all the iterations thereof. Now, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you do it, separate the hero, the protagonist from meaningful aid in a way that is a little bit original, that makes a little bit of sense, that doesn't blanketly declare that all civil servants are evil or stupid. Because that has fed into the party line of the re infutilists Now, to get back to what Alexis said, if you look at if you look at what people are doing now, and this circles back to Amanda, 
if you look at what people are doing right now, a month ago, people were expect, expecting a skyrocketing of domestic violence from people crammed in together. Um, a, a, a huge upsurge in divorce. So far, what we've seen is a massive number of bread making machines and exercise equipment <laughs> ordered on Amazon. Those are the two things that, that have skyrocketing in orbit. And uh, what I would do right now is invest in these fitness centers whose stock has, has crashed through the floor because people are buffing. Now, is that nihilism? You know, my next blog, I'm going to be posting it tomorrow afternoon, is going to be publish my general response to people who are using their time to start a novel. Wow. You now, is that nihilism? It's, I ask you. Well, you know, it's not nihilism. There's going to be a lot of novels out there. Well, uh, yeah, 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 and then 99% of them will be crap. Are you so, writing a new novel? What? Have you started a novel during this time? Or you are, there, are there several else. projects you're working on? No? You and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I finally have like, you know, what is it called when you have the internal conflict and then there's the conflict resolution, right? Well, there's story arcs. And yeah, my first, so. one of the top pieces of advice I give young writers, or young figuratively, is your first novel should be a murder mystery. No matter whether you want to do science fiction, romance, or anything like that, because a murder mystery, mm. you are fair with the audience. You... Uh, you have to be, or they'll notice. Uh, I've never story, heard that advice. That's interesting. Yeah, because because um, there are only three responses when you get to the who done it, the revelation in a murder mystery. One is, huh? Where'd that come from? The second is, uh, of course, I uh, saw it a mile away. But you've got to understand that you're in a sadomasochistic relationship. As the writer, you're the sadist, and the reader is a masochist, mm. and she or he wants to hate herself. The moment you get to the revelation, the third possible response is what they want. It's, of course, of course, of course. I just, I, I a moment of utter self-loathing <laughs> because if you had just one more IQ point or just, just focused a little better, you would have caught the bastard and you didn't want to. You didn't want to. You wanted it all to make sense and come as a shock and to tear the book in half, throw it out the window and dive after it. That. We were on the Orient Express. They all did it. <laughs> well, if you, then if you take it back to here, Raymond Chandler, it's almost like people read somebody like that, not for the plot, really, like they would for Dashiell Hammett talking about the or James M. Kahn, but rather, you know, just the freaking description of the sunset. But that's another kind of we're in the woods here on literary stuff. Sorry. I know, I know. Did, and we're, I think we're running out of time. Are there any have, last questions? Uh -huh. Amanda, give me one more. David, if you will, thank you for the piece on nihilism. I'd love to have more of that with you. If you were writing Corona 2020, <laughs> great <time. laughs> how would the story end? Well, it, it, this is both a nightmare and a training exercise. It is a respiratory illness that spread through the air um, by uh, people who don't even know yet that they're infected. Now, that's a nightmare. On the other hand, the death rates are very low for such a thing. And so it's very likely that we will look back on this as having something that slapped us awake and got us to do the resilience-oriented things that are desperately needed. And I have an interview that I'll give Amanda to post with EACM about a dozen ways in which we have let ourselves down 
uh, as far as resilience to shock is concerned, because surprising shocks are the bread and butter of science fiction. Mm -hmm. Something hits us, and then the protagonists can't get help. They have to handle the problem. So this is the world. Welcome to my world. <laughs> and I've, been, I've written at least a dozen things about pandemics long before this. And that is the segue to a little number that uh, was on. I memorized this just hearing it once. Hmm. It was on an NPR broadcast called Unpacking the 80s in 1979. I think your parents hadn't um, graduated high school yet, Amanda. And... <coughs> And the, <laughs> by Jesse, somebody or other, I have Googled like mad and I have not been able to find this. Thing. Oh, okay. A challenge for our, yes. viewers, our viewers. The first name of the artist was Jesse and it was all about what the 80s would be like. And they, one of the segues, one of the sec sections of this delightful uh, show uh, was set in 1987 in a future when this this... Cold has everybody, when this virus has everybody down. <sighs> Back in the Pleistocene, when we were still marine, a virus launched a quest to be the perfect guest and rearranged our genes. It's a virus, it's inspired us to rise above the mud. It's a virus, it's desirous of your very flesh and blood. Now I know your body's burning, but don't give up the ghost. Tiny viruses are turning you into the perfect host. host. Wow. I did, I did a that. That. Is that your song? No, no, no. That's from that 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 show, that NPR song. Oh, okay. Well, All right. Sure, it's on there. Yeah. I only remember oh. some of it. I, I have a blog from a few weeks ago, and I'll repost. Uh, I'll send it to you guys where I filled in various other lyrics. <laughs> so I'm I'm so thankful for your time, David. It's always mm -hmm. a pleasure to see you. Um, I know we have a virtual social club right now, but you you've always been so gracious. Um, giving of your time, whether you and I are interacting or you're attending an event and you're speaking to the masses, or I know you took time even when, when my son Leo was there and he had to do some writing and his friends were fascinated and you stopped what you were doing to really, to really give back to the kids. So I, I appreciate that. And I think this here is, is, is a platform we're creating where we're giving voice and power back to the people. And, um, we're calling it, you know, a collective genius. And one of my favorite moments when we were up at the cafe, one of our first, first encounters, you were sitting there just observing. And you turned to me and he said, I want to be you. I, I just, <laughs> I think your life is so interesting. And um, God, after spending this hour with you and, and just listening to, to everything you have to say and your accomplishments and, and, and just learning more about you as a person, I just honestly want to say, I want to be you. <laughs> so, so maybe your next book will be about how, how people can, you know, switch bodies. Or switch uh, uh, bodies. Uh, Philip Jose Farmer, Roger Zelazny, there's some cool stuff about that. Yeah. Oh, and and, and um, Robert Sheckley's book, Mind Swap. You can just fill that in the blanks there. Yeah. But um, great David questions. David Brand, everybody. Uh, <laughs> great questions, Steve and Alexis, and I look for, forward to further conversations. And let me just leave you with this. <clears throat> Fairy tales can come true. It can happen to you if you're young at heart. And if you compete fairly and cooperate to save a civilization that's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Until we mount Thank the you. steps to the Bella V again. Thank you, guys. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you for that journey. Thank you for that lovely, lovely journey.